you know, journeying into my pastor walk, I kind of look in the word and kind of look for the mysteries. Because sometimes when you read, you say that it has to be more than just this. And then you start questioning God like, like I always question God, like even when he healed the blind man, he said, open your eyes. And, Am- and Jesus said, do you see? He said, I see people, but they look like trees. And then he said, he said, all right. He touched him again. He said, open your eyes now. And then he see how we can see. Do you think Jesus made a mistake there? No, he was trying to show him something, you know. Sometimes we can, I see people and I see trees. You can see who bear good fruit. You can see who bears bad fruit. And you can see who's ready to be cut down. And you're like, Lord, help me save this person. So, so Jesus didn't make mistakes. And just questioning God. Some people call him doubting Timothy, you know, doubting Thomas. I mean, call him doubting Thomas. And, and, you know, w- one of the questions that Thomas gave to Jesus is said, Jesus, where are we going, bro? Like, you got us walking in direction, ain't telling us nothing, but saying, follow me. Which is the way? I at least want to know where are we going so I could GPS it, whatever, or, or know what sandals to wear, where I, I should wear my flaps or my cleat sandals. I don't know what kind of sandals they had back in the day. But he wanted to be prepared. For the journey, he said, I want to know the way. Jesus said, you want to know the way? That question right there gave us one of the greatest revelations ever. Jesus said, you want to know the way? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. No man. He says, I am the way, truth, and life. I am the outer court, the inner court, and the holies of holies. So, He was trying to tell Thomas, you don't have to be prepared when you're following me. I will prepare you. I will give you the words to say. I will give you the attitude to have. Amen. Amen. So today is Palm Sunday. Whoop, whoop. And we sang Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. We see Jesus. We see Jesus finally Entering the Passover. And it was times in John 2, 4 and John 7, 6 and John chapter 8 when, 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 when Jesus was, was ready to um, go at the uh, wedding feast and his mom said, you know what? They need wine. Whatever he tell y'all to do, prepare the wine, go get me jars and water. And we found out through that revelation that Jesus' first miracle was him assigning to us that I'm your husband. I'm your husband. I'll provide the wine. Amen. But he said, Mary, it is not my time yet. And then his brother's trying to make fun of him. Oh, you the Messiah, right? You claim to be the Messiah. Well, go to the feast. He said, it is not my time yet. It was a couple of times when, when people were telling Jesus something, but what they said, he kind of took it as, it is not my time. Well, this is the day when Jesus was finally prepared that it was his time. He was sitting in a house ready to be prepared for his burial. He was at Jerusalem arriving in Bethany. And a week before, he went to Simon's, the leper's house. And he's sitting there talking amongst them. And then a woman breaks a jar of oil and anoints him and prepares him for his burial. Jesus Fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9, where I'm going to paraphrase, it said that our salvation, our king, will come into Jerusalem and ride on a donkey. So he sends his disciples out to get a donkey. And then he, he fulfills the prophecy by entering the eastern gate. And I always talked about how the walls of Jerusalem being with the temple inside really represent, represent resembles i was trying to say resemble and represent represent and resembles us you know i always say we have gates that surround us i always say that the temple of the lord is in here this is where he wants to live because earlier in the book of john you see jesus goes in the temple what happens what he sees is abomination he sees the Pharisees selling 
sell it, say, ah, oh, your blam, he got a little spot, but but if you sell that but um that lamb, I got a hundred dollar lamb over here. We seen that they were trying to go up another way. And if John chapter 10, verse 1 and 2 say, if you're trying to go up another way, you're a thief and a robber. We seen that the leaders of the church in the temple were robbing the people. And then what Jesus goes in there and do, he takes off his 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 belt and start whipping people. You know, he start flipping tables of the money changers because he says, this is not how you get to me. This is not how you get to God. You cannot pay your way into heaven. You cannot take indulgences from people and lie to them and tell them, now nah, you're blessed. That was, they was robbing. But Jesus was really going to the temple and it represents you. Jesus was really going to the temple to see if you made a place for him to stay. So when you look at this, look at yourselves. All right. Jesus is the king. Let the king be lifted up. Right. That's what we sung earlier. And as we were singing it and repeating it, you know what? I was looking at people and I said, let the king be lifted up in James. Let the king be lifted up and my brother Sean. Let the king be lifted up and the children back there. And little Dallas, let the king be lifted up. Because I'm seeing the king walking through the gates. And I'm seeing Jesus walking into your life. When Jesus walks into those gates, they start praising him. The Messiah is here. Hosanna. Hosanna. And a couple of days later, they're saying, crucify him crucify him well it's passover guys the roman emperor Pilate says you know what jesus i could let you free if you want me to you know uh the pharisees turned you over and and they're saying you know i find nothing against you i could let you free but he said you know what it's not your will it's my father's will he said, I could let myself free if I really want to, but I got to take this walk. So he brings out a murderer named Barabbas. And he says, OK, I'm going a, I'm to a give you a chance. Jesus. I'm going to give you another chance, Jesus. Like, I will put a murderer, Barabbas, who they hate, and then I will put you, Jesus. And I know they're going to let you free. It's Passover. You know, we let somebody free every Passover. But we see everybody screaming. They just worshipped him as the Messiah and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, the highest, the Messiah is here. And the next day they saying, crucify him. And then when Pilate comes, he says, who do you choose, Barabbas or Jesus? And they said, Barabbas, Barabbas. And they wanted to still kill Jesus. And that story represents you. A couple weeks ago, Moses spoke about that the word is looking for a body. The Bible, the spirit of God, the heavenly of heavenlies, the kingdom of heaven is looking for a body to reside in. And then a week after that, God gives me a word saying, look beyond the veil. And then after that, Brother Matthew speaks about you have to make a choice. So what are we choosing here today? Are we going to choose Barabbas or we're going to choose Jesus? Because when Jesus comes into your life, yo, I went to church today. I got saved. People think they got they went up to the altar and they got saved, right? Like, yo, I got saved today. But then two weeks later, when life happens. Yo, what's up with that bottle, cuz? You know what I mean? Spark up, cuz. They, they forget about Jesus walking into their life on a donkey as the Messiah, ready to set them free because the Passover is to set you free. Death passed over. On the 10th plague in the, books of, in the book of Exodus, on the 10th plague, it was a plague of darkness and death. But the blood of the lamb that covered the door allowed death to pass over. And that was on the 10th day of Nisan. 
the tenth day of Nisan, when 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 Passover happened in the book of Exodus, and the same day when Jesus rode on that donkey through the eastern gate was the tenth day of Nisan. That was the beginning of the end. You know, Jesus is starting to come into your life right now. But sometimes it's going to be friends in your life that said, man, you don't need to go to church. That Jesus stuff weird. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that was a that came from the slave masters, that white Jesus and stuff. We ain't served Jesus in Africa. You better read your Bible more. You know what I'm saying? So they tried to kick Jesus back in so you can choose Barabbas. But Jesus, him entering into Jerusalem behind the walls is really him going into your life. And sometimes as we excited to choose Jesus, we're quickly to ignore him and put him to death. And what I am about to jump into is what God showed Ezekiel, what it looks like when he looks at a person. So today's reading will be the book of Ezekiel chapter 8. And this is pretty deep here. You know, Ezekiel is a book of visions. But I'm going to try to break it down so that you can understand some of the things that God sees when he walks into your life. When, when the word is looking for a body, this is what he sees. When Jesus is trying to walk into your life, these are the things he has to face in order to call you out of sin. Amen. Amen. So the book of Ezekiel chapter 8. These are called the vision of repulsive acts in Jerusalem. Amen. So I'm going to read it out the New King James Version. Oh, it's called the uh, abomination of the temple. Things that are inside of us that we don't even know it's there. You know, there's things that are inside of us that has rooms for God. But we store other things in the rooms. Amen. We have a love for things of the world. We have a love for things that make us feel good. Amen. We want that dopamine, that feel good sensation from the world. When we can't find it in God, we'll run quickly to the world. Amen. But sometimes God, to, to, in order to purify gold, it has to go through the fire. It has to go through the fire. Amen. Amen. So Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1. This is a very complex scripture. I would try to break it down as much as possible. Amen. <clears throat> if anybody receives something, yell it out. I don't even care. Amen. We're all one body. And Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1 says, And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah, Sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. Then I looked, and there was a likeness, like the appearance of fire from the appearance of his waist and downward, fire, and from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. Amber is between like a, a, a orange, yellowish, reddish, something very bright. So he sees somebody that, that when he has a vision looks like fire from the waist down and something so ambery, bright from the waist up. Amen. Sometimes I feel like this is Jesus here. Amen. So then... We are at verse 3. He stretched out the form of his hand and took me by a lock of my hair. Yeah, Ezekiel had dreadlocks, right? And he took me by a lock of my hair, right? He said he took me by a lock of my hair and the spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven. You know, when a couple weeks ago, we, we, we talked about going up another way. The spirit can lift you up. Amen. The spirit can lift you up. Amen. So the spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven 
and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat, the image of jealousy was, which provoked to jealousy. All right. If we are the gate, right? And the east, the east is the inside. The east is the garden. Jesus entering the east gate. The east is inside of you. The east is the compartment of God. The east is the holies of holies. Then what is the north gate? Amen. When I start to think about the scripture, y'all ever had a moment where one of your friends pulled up in a brand new car? And everybody like, yo, that car hot. Yo, where you get that car? Oh, what's up with them wheels? But it's always something like, man, somebody always hating, right? You can see they jealousy on their face, boy. That jealousy will manifest in their face. How was it in the movie, Belly? The dude was eating a banana. <laughs> I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them ninjas, huh? So, so, you know, sometimes the image of jealousy is so strong in the mind that it'll manifest in the face. So when it says that the image of jealousy was on the north gate and provoked to jealousy, we are created in the image of God. Our mind should be the mind of Christ. But when we set up an image of what we worship in our mind, spiritually now, image in the worship in our mind, the minute somebody has a come up, we are jealous. Why did they kill Jesus? They were jealous. They were jealous. Why did they kill Jesus? They were jealous of him. Jesus will preach, man, 5,000 people will come up. 5,000 people will, will be there. And they were jealous of him. That's why they killed him. They were, they were completely jealous of Jesus. So we see that sometimes, even in, 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 in the body, somebody's lifted up and people will be jealous of them. And it provokes God to be jealous of you. Like, come on, man. Like, God is a jealous God, right? And my wife gave a beautiful example one time. She said, I believe God is a jealous God because when you have a problem or a situation, you're quick to call your bestie on the phone. And that's why God is a jealous God, because he wants you to call him first. Amen. Sometimes you call God, you ain't got to call nobody else. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes Mo asks me certain, certain stuff, I'll send him a text, and two minutes later, I'll send him a scripture. And it goes totally against what I just told him, because I'll be humble, like for real. Amen? So, so, so Ezekiel is in a vision, all right? Ezekiel's in a vision and God is taking him into a temple. But what is a temple? It's us. I want you to see how God is taking Ezekiel to look at a person. All right? This is what it is. All right? So he, he, he took him by a lock of his hair. The spirit lifted him up. And it was an image of jealousy there. All right? Verse 4. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there like the vision I saw in a plane. All right. He said the glory of God was there like a vision. Amen. So God was in there. God is in our image. Right. In verse five. Then he said to me, son of man, lift your eye now towards the north. So I lifted up my eyes towards the north and there north of the altar gate was this image of jealousy and the entrance. If this, if your face, your head is the north gate, there's a lot of entrances there. You have your eye gate, your nose gate, your mouth gate, and your ear gate. They're all up there. And you know what you have the image up here? Jealousy. God will spiritually go into your mind and see a big statue of jealousy. And he goes around into your brain, but there's no, there's no statue of him. Amen. My, my God is my strong tower. Amen. He is supposed to be the image in our brain. So he lifted up his eyes. And the minute he enters the north gate, the persons, the mind, he saw an image of 
jealousy. Amen. So verse 6, furthermore, he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. It's things that we do that, that draws us away from God, far away from his sanctuary. If his sanctuary is in here, but you're looking at all the pleasures outside of here. Amen. You're looking at pleasures and your other members of your body. And I'm talking about this body. Amen. Other members of your body you want to please besides here, the sanctuary. Amen. So so he said, now turn again. You will see greater abominations. Now, God has taken Ezekiel to, to something. He said, you see that, right? You see, as soon as you go into the entrance, there's a big image of jealousy, right? And soon as, as, as you, you go in, you say, everything that they're doing is drawing them away from me. Everything that they're doing is drawing them away from the sanctuary. He said, but look again. Ezekiel, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're going to go deeper into this person. All right? This is deliverance here. Amen? So, so he said, verse 7, So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. We, we say open doors. We say open doors because sometimes we open a door to the enemy. Amen. To sneak in. Sometimes we'll, we'll leave a hole in a gate for the fox to come in. Amen. There's an open door and Ezekiel sees it. And, and, and Jesus points it out of him. He said, look, there's a hole in the wall, a little hole right there. And verse eight, he says, then he said to me, son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. Amen. So you might, you might picture a temple with a small hole in it and Ezekiel in there with a shovel digging it out. As he's digging, he digs up to another door. And, Jesus, and he's like, Lord, I went through this hole and it's another door. He said, open it. I'm going to show you. But as I'm, as I'm talking physically, I want you to think spiritually. On what hole we have in our life. Because another gate, if your five senses are five of the eight gates, another gate is your skin. All right? The biggest living organism is your skin. All right? You can be tempted by skin. You could be tempted by touch. Something can enter through your skin. So there was an open door some way, somehow that's getting in. And Jesus told Ezekiel, you see that open door? Go in. Dig in there. All right. Also, this has to do with deliverance. Sometimes when you're trying to pull something out of a person, you got to dig deeper. You got to dig deeper. Amen. Amen. So he, he brought him into the door of the court. He saw the hole of the wall. Then, then Jesus told him, son of man, dig into the wall. And when he dug into the wall, there was a door. Verse 9. And he said to me, go in and see their wicked abominations which they are doing. So now he went in through the hole. Now he's going into the door. Verse 10. So I went in and I saw and there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around the walls. Deep. Ezekiel goes in and inside of all the walls, there were all types of creeping things, things that were attached there. There were strongholds that were uh, that, uh, through the bloodline. You know, there was your makeup. There were things you did in secret. Amen. There were things that were happening that that Ezekiel saw. And I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15 real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15. 
And this is God speaking. Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Herob of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptedly and make for yourself carved images in the form of any figure. So God didn't want nobody to have no image of any figure whatsoever. He wanted us to have the image of him. He wanted us to have the mind of Christ. He wanted us to look at, when we look at God, we look at everything and not look at everything as if it's a God. Amen. So he said, Lest you act, verse 16, lest you act corruptly and make for yourself the carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of a male or female, all right? We know through our marriage classes, we got pretty deep with it, that you can, you can worship a male, and you can worship a female, and you can make an idol and put them even above God. Verse 17, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. And take heed lest you lift up your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun, the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given all the people under the whole heaven as a heritage. God made all that for us anyway. He made that the, every animal was for us. The moon, the sun, and the stars was for us. But we feel like we have to worship it. And, and, and if you ever studied, um, man, John Eckert's book, uh, 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 on deliverance, you never know that the animal kingdom has a demonic kingdom operation. So somebody can have a spirit of the fox, and how you know? They sneaky. They sly for. They be lying. A swiper, no swiping. Amen. But look, this stuff is real. People will have a spirit of a python that'll choke you up. <laughs> no, but if you study the animal kingdom, like like I remember Jamal hit me up. He was like, yo, you know when when in, in the time of Noah during the flood, why is it that the raven kept flying but the dove came back? And I said, I'm not going to tell you, but what I want you to do is study the raven. Then you know the acts of a raven. Then you know exactly why. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I can see the animals on people. And, and, and I, just, I just let them like, I just look at them from a far away. I don't be saying nothing though. I don't be saying. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to say nothing. But this is the discernment that God gives us. He gives us to see this stuff. When we look at people, if you let them talk long enough, they will snitch on themselves. They will snitch on themselves. Let them, let them talk. Let them run up, run it up. Amen. They will snitch on themselves. The demon will manifest. So when we went into the book of Ezekiel and he said the image was jealousy because they were manifesting jealousy. Amen. I feel like we got that in, in this uh, hovering over Camden. Somebody be trying to make it out of Canada, maybe by holding him back. So we see some artists and everything be good in music, but people, I'd be like, yo, you got to go somewhere else. Go, go to Atlanta. They probably appreciate you more. Like, Amen. Amen. So we're back in Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel is going in through a wall, and he's seeing all these creeping, crawling images all over the wall. Creeping things, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the Israel portrayed all around the wall. 
This is a time where Babylon took over Israel because God was telling his people to worship me. Stop going into these mountains worshiping other gods. Stop going in the dark having orgies with other people and these other gods. Stop going outside of my marriage, the union between flesh and God, between spirit and man. Stop going out of that union and worshiping another God. But Israel wanted to worship God, but in secret worship something else. In secret, in secret, God sees everything. In Revelation, it said that Jesus had the eyes of fire. See everything. Superman. See right through that wall. Jesus walked through the wall like Thomas. You ain't believe me? Ta -da -da -da, touch me. I'm right here. Like, well, right through the wall. He taking Ezekiel right through the wall. Right through the wall. This is the same visions we can have when we see a person. When you standing in that mirror, look at yourself. I remember when we went to Chicago and, and, and me and her took a, a deliverance class. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, yo, this little girl kept trying to rebuke Leviathan out of me. And I was like, I was like, I was like, I don't know why she did that. There's nothing prideful about me. That was prideful right there. <laughs> Thinking ain't nothing wrong. I was like, never mind. I'm bad. My bad. My bad. That, that was prideful. Thinking something, something ain't nothing wrong with you. I say, Leviathan, come out, like, for real. But sometimes we got to look at ourself and see what is sticking to you. Amen? What is sticking to you that God is trying to search your heart, that Jesus is trying to prepare a place a room with many mansions. He's trying to take the temple and flip the money changers so it can be corrected the way it's supposed to be so you can worship him and conquer every storm even, even at peace. Amen. So Jesus is taking Ezekiel into, his, into here and he see everything all over the wall. We got to look at what's, what kind of idols is in our walls. Was laying on our left hand. I remember uh, we went to uh, Boise, Idaho with my old apostle, uh, Gusto Perez. And I, we were uh, performing deliverance over this young lady. And that was one of the wildest deliverance I ever had to. She was very strong. Um, it was me, my brother Marcus, and one of the uh, other women from the ministry. And... And while she was going crazy on the floor, she was throwing herself back. So I put myself on the floor, my back to her back. And I'm telling this thing to come out in Jesus' name. The first thing that I got was adultery. I said, you adulterous spirit, come out in Jesus' name. She said, I don't cheat. I was like, yes, you do. The spirit of lying, come out in Jesus' name. I said, the spirit of fornication, you have no power. Once I said that, her right hand started going crazy. Right hand. I'm talking about the whole time I'm doing deliverance, Mark's behind me, the other sister was right there. I'm like, yo, I'm going to figure out what this thing is. Her right hand is going like this. My brother Marcus said, Kenny, I know what it is. Discernment. Her right hand is going crazy. I know how she. I was thinking physical adultery. I was thinking physical fornication. I was thinking the spirit of lying. Her right hand is going crazy. He said, I can see her hand. It's masturbation. I said, the spirit, because you can, you can have an image of a man right here and have sex with him in the spirit. A, a, a soulmate in the spirit. I called this thing out. She let out a loud cry and just passed out. Praise God for her being free. During this three-day conference, she came the next day, totally different person. She didn't even look the same. But I recognize her because of her kids. But she, they snitch on themselves. Let's have discernment. There are some things that could be on the walls of your life that the average eye can't see. But you're doing it in secret, in the spirit. 
Amen. These are the things that God sees everything you do in secret. God sees what you look at when you're scrolling through your phone. God sees what you look at when you're in the daze. God sees what you look at even in your dreams. Even in your dreams. Amen. So in verse 12, we're in verse 12, verse 11. I think we're in verse 11. And there stood before me them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. And in their midst stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. All right. Verse 12. Then he said to me, son of man, you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols, for they say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken his land. What was one of the uh, what was one of the uh, sins that people do in secret more than any other sin? First Corinthians, I think it's chapter. We learned it to uh, in ministry class. Does anybody remember? It was 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 15 says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Yes, your whole body, your arm member, leg member, you know, female, male organ member, all belong to Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined a harlot and one body is a harlot with her for the two he says shall become one flesh so when 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 you fornicate against god and serve other things you serve a creation you serve a drug you serve a, a man or you serve a woman you come one with that harlot amen for the two he says shall become one flesh but he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him verse 18 flee sexual immorality every sin that a man does is outside the body but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body so he said every sin that a man does it's outside the body but sexual sin guess where that at inside the body that's inside the body so when Ezekiel is taking that tour through the people of Israel, guess what they were doing? Sexual sins inside the body. And, 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 and the word says that God told Ezekiel, they think I don't see them. Say, they think I don't see them. It says, verse 12, then he said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in a dark Every man in the room of his own idols. Every man secretly in his own room of idols. For they say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken us. One of the things you do in the dark, God sees everything. If you're looking for the approval of man, you think you could stand upright before man. You think that I can't see. God sees everything you do in the dark dark and you're going to be convicted by the holy spirit and guess what when you convicted by the holy spirit people can see it in your face people with discernment can see it in your face verse 13 and he said to me turn again and you will see greater abominations than that i know ezekiel like man you got me going through all these doors they tripping they doing worse than this lord they offering up praises and in the dark rooms and I'm seeing creeping things all in their life. I see their sexual sins, what they do in the dark. All it, it gets worse than this, Lord. It gets worse than this, Ezekiel. Going to this other gate. So he brought him, verse 14. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Does anybody know what Tammuz is? Anybody? Tammuz is the son of Nimrod. Nimrod was 
a great hunter before the Lord. He was trying to hunt souls. Amen. Nimrod built a tower to reach God. But when you try to reach God another way, you're what? A thief and a robber, right? He tried to erect a building, but they chopped up Nimrod into 13 pieces, but the only piece that they didn't find was his male organ, all right? So when, so when Semiramis, Semiramis was Nimrod's wife, Semiramis was said, this is the folklore, Semiramis was said to go to the moon, right? She came back down as the egg, as an egg, right, landed on earth, and her fertility of Nimrod was able for her to have the resurrection of Nimrod and bore a son, which was Tammuz. Tammuz was the resurrection of Nimrod. Amen. And her fertility, that's why uh, this time of year they celebrate Easter eggs and Easter bunnies because it really represents the uh, birthing of Tammuz. Because Semiramis came down in the egg, and when the egg opened, rabbits ran out. That means she was fertile, and she birthed Tammuz out of Nimrod's seed. So the resurrection of Nimrod was in Semiramis. This resurrection was Tammuz. But uh, another resurrection of Tammuz was the obelisk. Does anybody know what an obelisk is? When they found when they found uh, all of Nimrod's body but didn't find a male organ, that resurrection became an obelisk. Does anybody know what an obelisk is? An obelisk, the Washington Monument, you know that stall statue you see in Egypt, you see in other temples all over the world, you see as the Washington Monument in D.C. That's also... A, a, a thing that represents the male organ, which is Thomas. So when you see here, it says in verse 14 that he was dismayed because women were sitting there weeping for Thomas. I don't have to explain too much about that. You see what they were worshiping. You see the image that they had in their mind. Amen. Was which this. Tammuz was an obelisk, but it represents the male organ. Amen. I mean, Ezekiel seeing everything. God being raw with Ezekiel. All right. So Tammuz was the son of Nimrod. You could read him uh, later on in your own time. But we're almost finished. Amen. Amen. So you see that Ezekiel is going in the temple. He's seeing all this sin, but it's really he's going into a person. These things are on us. If we are the temple, do we have a hole in the wall? Do we have some creeping things that is a thorn in our flesh and we don't know how to control it? Amen. So we have to really examine and take over our mind, take over our body to where it all lift up Christ. Because don't you know your body belongs to Christ as 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says. Amen. Amen. So verse 15. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again. You will see greater abomination than these. I, I know if I was a Jew, I don't even want to see no more. You ever watch a movie of God so girl, you don't even want to see. Change the channel or something like make some tea and let's sit in the kitchen and talk. There's some things that I don't want to see. Somebody sent me a video of that Nas X dude. Twerk, twerking on Satan. I said, one, two, three, four. That's enough. Don't need to see no more. That was one of the nastiest, most abomination things I ever saw in the history of my entire life. I thought when I was a little boy catching my mom and dad was disgusting. This was, boy, this top that into the. My bad, y'all. It was gross. I'm sorry. It was gross. I never saw something so crazy. But we see that he came out with a song that got all the kids going. Right, right, right. To the Old Town Road. You know what I'm saying? He got all the kids going. And now look what he's doing now. Who you think he's trying to pull on? Our children. He's trying to pull on our children. He's trying to put a hole in their wall. You know what I'm saying? He's trying to put creeping things inside of them. He's trying to get them to worship the things in the dark. He's trying to get these little girls to worship Tammuz. You know what I'm saying? We have to see how Satan is strategically doing this stuff. And we are the body, man. We got to fight back some way, somehow. 
If God put a song inside of you, push it out. If God put anything inside of you, push it out. This world needs it. Amen. Amen. So Jesus told him again, turn again. You will see greater abominations than these. Verse 16. So he brought me in the inner court of the Lord's house and there at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they were worshiping the sun towards the east. Amen. They had their back towards the temple. And they're worshiping the sun towards the east. Jesus belongs in the east. God belongs inside of you. But sometimes we'll turn on back on God. Because this looks more attractive. They already feel like God has not been there for them. And sometimes we get spoiled, y'all. Sometimes this stuff don't go our way. We get mad at God. God like, man, I'm not giving you that. You don't even know where that's going to take you. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make you become who I created in heaven for you to become. You don't even know what you're about to become. Only I know Jonah, you know what I'm saying? Jonah didn't want to save Nineveh. God had to make him hit a U-turn. Say he was carried by a whale, a big vessel. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we don't even know what's good for us. People are like, follow your dream. I'm like, follow Jesus, boy. Follow that dream. Amen. Amen. So, so these men were worshiping the sun in the temple. Another worship of sun is Baal worship. All right. During the time of Baal worship, during the time they would they would plant, they feel like the sun gave them life, the sun gave them light, you know, the things that God created the sun to do. They worship more of the sun than everything else that God created the earth to do. So so they would they will reap the harvest and then during a time they would give offerings to the sun god to saturn they would even offer up their children you know what i'm saying to the sun god and god is like yo they're worshiping other gods inside the inner court inside the inner court not only on the walls inside their feelings in their heart in their mind the inner court they have they're worshiping the sun they're more thankful from the what the sun give than what i give them Amen. Verse 17. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? It is a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit abominations where they commit here. For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put a branch to their nose. To to put a branch to your nose is very irritating, very irritating. Some kids put the little grass thing up their nose, you know. For people that took the COVID test, I heard that thing had to go way back up here. The Q-tip had to go way back up into their brain. And I heard it was the most irritating thing. So these things are, are the branch to their nose really means this really irritated God. He delivered them out of Egypt. He put them in a, in, in a promised land. He gave them everything. He defended them. And because of all the abomination they wanted, he said, Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor I will have pity. And though they cry, in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. So if you got all this going on in your life and you're trying to cry out to God and stuff and wondering why he don't hear you, maybe he's trying to deliver you from all them things first so he can hear you clearly. Maybe these things are so far gone in your head, you don't even know what you want. You don't even know what the, the desires of your heart. 
because you're listening to the wrong voices in your head. You're allowing these creeping things and, and other worships dominate your, your thought process that you can't even really process what God is trying to do in your life. So when Jesus was walking into the eastern gate, the Messiah was walking, is really Jesus walking into your life? And we have to make a decision, like Brother Matthew said. What are we going to do? Are we going to continue with this abomination? Or are we going to have to make a choice to say, I don't want to take that path no more. I've been doing this for the last five years and it haven't brought me peace. God, what do you have for me? Amen. Amen. Jesus, Jesus died and we chose Barabbas, but that Barabbas was really us, you know. He took the punishment for Barabbas that a murderer could be set free. Yeah, we were murderers. We were adulterers. We were sinners. We, we were fornicators. But Jesus can set you free today. The king is being prepared for his burial on Palm Sunday. He was willing to die on a cross so that he could be in your life. So that he can... Reconnect that relationship between you and God. He can make you a conqueror. We are no longer losers. We are no longer people that said, I can't take this no more. I give up. And Jesus is right there like, choose me. When all the world's problems having you ready to drown, Jesus is going to pull you out of that. Like he pulled Peter out the water and said, when did you lose faith? When did you lose faith? When you were 11 years old and your dad walked out of your life, when did you lose faith? When somebody touched you the wrong way and nobody was there to help you, when did you lose faith? When you couldn't take the problems of life and, and, and you started drinking and smoking and getting high, when did you lose faith? Because I was with you the whole time. I created you in heaven. I put you here on earth. I chose your mom and dad to be together at a certain time that when it's your time to, to be on earth, your mom was pregnant. You was in your mother's womb. I put these friends around you to shape you in a personality that you was going to love me in the way you love me. And then when you grow up, guess what? You're going to start going to a place called Royal Cloth. And you're going to meet like mind believers. And then Royal Cloth is going to transition into School of Light. And the School of Light, I will send more people and more people and more people that, that, that you know that I've been with you your whole life because everybody's that I'm going to send you in the future is going to have a like minded believer. You're not going to know long suffering, but I'm going to send you somebody like a Moses that when you see long suffering numb it would have strength you in long suffering because patience is to deal with something that we cannot change let's say we had a kickball game it's raining outside can't do nothing about it got to be patient to next week rain check right that's what they call it patient check all right but long suffering is when we can we have a relationship with somebody we can change it we can do something about it but we tend to suffer it we tend to show grace that this person may mature or reach the level where God is trying to save them. That's long suffering. I learned long suffering. I learned hospitality from my wife that, 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 you know what I'm saying? She could, I'd be like, yo, you go there every Sunday at eight o'clock, put the mint, set the table, vacuum the chair, do this, do that, everything. I, that was an easy choice for her to be the gatekeeper because she'd be already here. You know what I'm saying? So so I I learned how to to be like Prophet Nikki and 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 just keep continue to pray in tongues. These things encourage me. I learned how to have a love for children and see Evie. So so when God sends you a family, God sends you a unity, God builds us up, he's gonna sh he's gonna put people with strength that we're all gonna learn from each other. Amen. We're all gonna learn from each other. I'm going to learn some things from you. I'm going to learn some things from you. I'm going to learn some things from you. And you might learn something from me. Hopefully you learned something from me today. <laughs> Praise God. Hope you learned something from me. But this is, this is the purpose of us uniting together. 
when Danny first came here, she said, yo, it's better on the scene than on the screen. Amen. You know, I ain't forget that. You know what I'm saying? And it, and, and it is better. The unified body, us coming together and praising God together. This is the things that God is trying to do in our life. Thank God for this family. Thank God that he put people that when, when, when you're in trouble, you could get on the phone real quick. When you don't understand something, you could get on the phone real quick. And be transparent. Be transparent with one another. We all been through something. We all been through something. We all got a story. We all got, maybe my story will help out yours. Maybe your story will help out mine. You know what I'm saying? I think mostly everybody that be preaching up here done been through prison system. You know what I'm saying? I hear y'all testimonies, but we all been through something. I thank God for my testimony when I hear somebody else's testimony. I was like, man, God, I thought I had it bad. I heard their testimony. Boy, I don't know how they still here. Like, that'll make you be grateful not only for that person, but if that person going to go through that much and still be here. Thank God that you put in my, my life that the, I was complaining about nothing. I kind of had it good, Lord. Like, so when Jesus is walking into your life, accept him. Accept him. Accept the willing to change for the better. The sign, he said it perfect. You know, fear is not going to conquer, but love is going to conquer. Loving Jesus, loving who God is. It's going to help you overcome. But you have to be long-suffering. You have to be long-suffering because when your patience is tested and you turn your back on God and start worshiping that son, you are worshiping something that is killing you. It's killing you. You know, we talk about the 12 disciples. We have 12 systems. Like, I learned the other day that drinking kills the liver, and the liver can kill the estrogen production into your breast. And a lot of women get breast cancer because I just learned that the other day. And I'm like, yo, they just, see, that's why certain things destroy your temple and it produces something else. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, so we really have to be careful on what we find joy in because it can kill you. It can kill you. These spiritual things can kill you. When we have health tips, you know what I'm saying? Worrying can make you sick. Fear can make you literally sick. Fear can The spirit of fear can have you sick. So as this Palm Sunday, you could take your palms and remember the day that Jesus walked into Jerusalem. As he's being prepared this whole week. Every day Jesus does something as a week of preparation for his burial. When I look at this palm, I was just like, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for being able to step up to the plate and save me. Now it's time for us to step up to the plate. As we transition into the new building, I'm excited. I'm excited. And it's not only a transition for us as a whole. But it's going to come to a time where I'm going to step down because I need y'all to step up. Amen. And I know Moses said that plenty of times. Moses said that. I, I heard him say that. In the, and remember when we were in Chicago and he was like, look, it ain't no more royal cloth. It's over. You know what I'm saying? Well, he was, and I'm still eating my pizza, everybody crying. I'm, I knew exactly what he was saying. And I'm like, yo, he not saying it's over, over. He just saying that. He's leading you to a point, and that point is over now because we all have to transition. He's not here today, and some of us might feel like, oh, we miss him, which I do. I want to go up there with him. But he's like, nah, I need you to, you know what I mean? We're going to have church. Okay, amen. But he's trying to prepare us to a point where we can stand firm when nobody's around. Even when you're being spiritually attacked by yourself, by your own body, your own mind is attacking your heart. Your own heart is attacking your mind. Can you stand up during a time when you're being attacked by yourself? Your mind is going crazy. Can you can you read the word of God said, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do this. 
I don't care what you say. I'm not going to use my hand to do that. I'm not going to use my eyes to do this. I'm not going to use my ears to do this. And I'm not going to even talk back to this person. Can you say that? And as we transition to this new building, a lot of us going to have to step up. James, we got to prepare you to step up. I'm dead for real. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to have to have certain people step up. It's going to be you one day up here. You know, Christina A. said, man, I get nervous when I come up here. But guess what? You're going to have to get comfortable in being nervous. When you ain't nervous, you don't know what you're doing. That's when you be like, Jesus, just do it. She said, Kenny, I got to go ahead. If God gave it to you, go ahead. Who am I? Who am I to stand in God's way? So during this time of transition, as Jesus was entering the eastern gate, we're going to have to ent- get on this donkey and enter the gate to get out of here, into a new building. That transition, there might be more faces than, than we normally see. You know what I'm saying? As we continue to see newer faces, let's have a greater love for them. Let our love be greater. Let our humility be greater. Let our patience be greater. Let our long-suffering be greater. Let our everything be greater. But let the name of Jesus be greater in our hearts, our minds, and in our souls. Because this transition is going to be real. So I hope the word bless somebody today. Y'all willing to take palms. Uh, We brought them for y'all. Just as a reminder that Jesus fulfilled his calling. And we could use him as a role model to be prepared to do what God called us to do. He fulfilled every prophecy. He completed what we couldn't complete. Now we can be in a garden with God. What kicked us out the garden? Jesus said, here goes the key. I conquered sin and death. I went into hell for three days. I have the keys. Come to me. I will give you the keys when you can be in a garden with God. Amen. Amen. So I'll close this out with a prayer. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for being here today, Father God. Lord Jesus, you prepared yourself for the burial. You said plenty of times, it's not my time. And then you took the initiative to know when it was your time to transition. The transition from going towards a burial to preparing yourself for death, to prepare yourself to know that you are the Messiah, but to prepare yourself to be ignored, to prepare yourself to take on the punishments of our sins with dishonor, with punching, whipping, the crown of thorns, the the stabbing, the crucifixion, Lord. You did all that punishment. You took it all for us because you loved us. Because your love was greater for us, Lord. Let's have that greater love too, as Sister Alicia talked about that. Her love and appreciation for strangers is what pushed her into a position. Let's take that as a spiritual thing, Father God. Let us have a love and appreciation for people we have no idea who they are. Let us not be afraid to speak to their hearts and in their minds. Let's not be afraid to tell them that God has created you and he has a purpose for you. Let's not be afraid to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father but by him. Thank you, Jesus, for paving a way that we may can reach your throne, Father God. That we could come to your throne, Father God. That you could snatch us, snatch us out of our locks into the heavenlies. And see what was going on. See what's going on in the temple. See the abominations in people. Father God, even just see the abomination in us. Help us clean our house, Lord. Jesus, if there's some tables that doesn't represent you, Lord Jesus, come into our life and flip some tables, Lord. Cut off our taste buds for the taste of this world, the taste for the things of this world, and create a hunger in us that we hunger you more, that we hunger worship music more, that we hunger intimate prayer with you more, Lord. 
Father God, I pray for everyone here and every children in the back. May the king be lifted up as we worshiped earlier. May you have your way. Continue to replenish this earth, Father God, as your will, but keep us driving safe on our way home. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody have a word or would like to share anything? If not, we're dismissed. Amen.